Hi, we're here at the Jerusalem Conference where I have the pleasure of sitting with Professor Uzi Arad, who is a well-known figure here in Israel. He is a director of the IDC in Herzliya, also the founder of the famed Herzliya Conference. Hello, thanks Hi. for joining us. It's good to be here. You, uh, today we're speaking about the threat of Islamic terror and actually what that does to democracies around the world. And I think you had a very interesting point talking about appeasement. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, my thought was that uh, I think most serious people know what is the nature of the beast, what is the threat, and let's uh, call a spade a spade. Uh, it is radical Islam, uh, driven by fanaticism, suicidal jihadism, uh, propensity to use terrorism, uh, going against Western uh, civilization, Israel included, and the risks also that this would expand into the nuclear and unconventional domain. So we are faced with historic and historic challenge. So that is not the new thing. Most serious people recognize that. What is distressing to me is to see how lax, how feeble, how indifferent is the reaction of the West. We do not have a sufficient degree of cohesion and understanding that this challenge necessitates uh, that we rise to the occasion, that we mobilize our resources. Quite the contrary, we see the administrations of various governments in the West follow the route of appeasement. What is engagement, if not appeasement? What is the talk about accommodating, uh, if not appeasement? What is the sacrifice sometimes of Israel, if not a form of feeding the crocodiles with something that may uh, at least defer uh, the challenge? So it is this current uh, that I found of uh, concern, uh, a concern not because that Israel is at the receiving end, but also because it would come uh, with, uh, to the detriment of the West. And historically, unless we change course, unless the West changes course, unless the leadership comes to the fore, we may lose that battle. There is no guarantee that we will win. The Muslims may still win. They certainly believe that history on their side. Maybe they're right. Maybe they are. I, th I think you've put it you know, in a nutshell and really focused on it. What in your mind, understanding the dynamics at work here in democracies around the world, the United States, even Israel, unfortunately, what, what kind of insight could you give us on how to change that? That is the problem, because left to themselves, there are so many charms and so much attraction to the converse policy. The policy of accommodation, the policy of feel good, the policy of avoiding calling an enemy an enemy, the policy of t talking about peace, the policy of making concessions. All these policies have a certain ease to them. They are attractive. They are sometimes incentivized by the prizes are given, grants are given, universities like that talk, uh, the media likes that talk. And, you know, democratic peoples are peace-loving. They want to go about their daily life. They want to maintain their liberties. Nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants to go for, you know, uh, blood, tears, and sweat. People want to go about their lives. So, left to themselves, uh, the forces of uh, wanting to be indifferent often are greater than the forces that bring about the galvanized action. But to change that, therefore, you need either powerful moral voices or great historical voices, and mainly people whose leadership is marked by the ability to tr transcend the temptations of doing the easy thing and to do the right thing. And unfortunately, we lack all three. And so basically, if I understand what you're saying, we're in, in pretty deeply yes, at this sir. stage. Are there things that the population, the populace, the civilians can do to bring about a change? I mean, if you take a look at grassroots movements here in Israel, you know, after the Winograd report, there were hundreds of thousands of people. In any normal democracy, that kind of number of the government would have gone home. We see that the government is standing resolute, playing games, saying they're not talking about Jerusalem, are talking about Jerusalem, and it seems like there's no, there's, there's nothing that people can do to bring well, this change in, in about. Well, Israel, in Israel, at least, uh, I can say that uh, there are those, principally in the Machane Leumi, the national 
camp who understand the issues. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu, with, with whom I work closely, does have the historical grasp, being the son of an historian. He has read the political landscape strategically correctly. His record shows to that, and I know that he understands the challenge. And besides, he has shown, as Minister of Finance, that he's certainly capable of doing the unpopular thing if this is what is required by the national interest. So I think that the change of management in Israel might do a great deal and would bring to power those who have a much more sober understanding of the realities than the present administration. But what will happen in the West? In the West, I don't know. You know, the American elections have to sort themselves out. European politics are also interesting. The Islamic component in Europe is increasing. Will that bring a backlash or will that bring an accommodation? One doesn't know. My feeling is I wish, I yearn for the uh, constellation in which you have on the world scene four, five great leaders. There used to be such leaders in the 80s, in the 70s, on the world map. You had in America, you had in Europe. Not everybody has got to be a leader, but you've got to have some people of stature. In France, we have a Sarkozy, who is an unknown quantity, but interesting. Certainly not typically French. Right. <laughs> um, He's actually, I believe, from uh, an old uh, Saloniki Jewish family. Yeah, department. yeah, yeah. Well, he shows. <laughs> uh, so we have to wait for that. And in the meantime, we have to affect the political changes as much as we can through the democratic uh, processes. And we have to make our voice heard. And in Israel, we have to have a management change for sure. And it will take place sooner or later. And in the West, I hope that the moral voices uh, will make an imprint. And besides, sometimes, sometimes it is the opposition, the enemy, who may overstep, who may provoke us into action. That, too, might be a catalyst, but that could be very costly as well. Right. Well, I was going to say that, you know, bringing up what you were talking about before, that in the past, you know, in order to wake up from appeasement back uh, before World War II, it took, uh, you know, the invasion of uh, Poland and the subsequent World War II to bring people, That's right. you know, That's up, right. to, up to facing reality. You know, hopefully... That kind of reality reawakening will happen before. But I'd like to pose maybe a, a very pointed question because you talk about management change. It seems obviously that Israel needs. The question is, I've heard people talking about the need for a, and I think it was even brought up in the conference, actually I think by a senator from the United States, about the need for actually a paradigm shift. In other words, it's not just a question of looking at appeasement or the need for bringing about some kind of peace. You know, I, I've heard people comparing, say, okay, the government now is talking about giving back 99.9% .9 of the territories as part of an appeasement arrangement that would theoretically bring peace, whereas maybe a Likud government today would give back only 85% or give back less of Jerusalem. The question is whether the population, the, the public, needs to understand that we maybe need a very thorough paradigm shift. In yes, other words, of course. to take off the table completely the notion that a two-state solution maybe is the right uh, highway I don't to think I don't think that uh, one has to go that far because at the end of the day, I don't think that the majority of Israelis want to see themselves responsible for the Palestinians. We do not want to control the, you know, the Palestinian population. It's... Uh, unnecessary. What we do want is to care for our borders, for the Jewish settlements, and for areas which are unpopulated, and to have our security interests uh, served well. But also to take under our responsibility uh, these populations which, believe me, are not the most productive on earth, would become uh, a burden uh, and we want to relieve ourselves of the burden of the Palestinian populations not territories it is territory we want to preserve but populations we want to rid ourselves of okay well, that sounds like an interesting uh, paradigm in itself and uh, I would think that it's uh, something that we'd like to get into possibly with you in a future date a lot more in depth I want to thank pleasure. you I know you're on your on your way to another meeting, so I want to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.